the uh, we're going to go to how about we go to Schoology? All right. In Schoology, in the Beast, there is an upload book summary here that was due yesterday. Again, I had air conditioning problems that was taking up 100% of my brain. I did not remind you of that yesterday, but you should have done it. Uh, you should have you should have written your uh, essay and be ready to have turned it in yesterday because that was what was assigned. So I will give you guys until uh, uh, the end of the day today. That means 11.59 today to turn it in. All right. In the morning, I will turn off this um, this assignment. And uh, if you haven't turned it in before I turn this off, you can put it in the late assignments and let's go. You can put it in the turn in late work and reduce here. All right. So it is in the beast folder and it is right here. The article summary is due on Monday. So get that done and turn that in. And, uh, and I think I've given you guys instructions for that. All right. There should be examples. I have examples of what it should look like and examples uh, and instructions for what it is. And I've also recorded myself giving you guys instruction for how to do this. So, all right, that is that. The next thing I want to talk about is uh, your detailed drawing was due yesterday. Again, I had AC troubles. That was 100% of my brain, so I didn't mention that yesterday. And turn that in with your uh, with your sketchbook today. Uh, most students will draw it in their sketchbook, uh, but if you have it on a loose sheet of paper, put it inside the sketchbook and turn that in. Any questions about that? So I will grade your notes and your detailed drawing. And I think also you have uh, the upload unit one article is due. That was due yesterday. And so it looks like some of you have turned it in. So the rest of you need to turn in your unit one article. And so, <laughs> and I've explained that. Find an, uh, an article that is about something that is in Unit 1. That's prehistoric, Mesopotamian, uh, Egyptian, or Aegean. Any questions about anything that I have discussed? Get all that turned in. So all the stuff that was due yesterday that you turn in in Schoology, I'm going to turn off in the morning, tomorrow morning. And so make sure you get it in before that. All right, go to your next empty page in your sketchbook. Yes, ma'am. Um, then you can write on uh, notebook paper or something and transfer it into your sketchbook later. Yes, ma'am. You need to what? All right, so let's do that during lunch. Come in during lunch or uh, directly after school today. All right, so much art history and never enough time to cover it all. So let's go run through the art museum. On your next empty page at the top, at the header, write chapter five, or you could write Greek art. Then go to your table of contents and write that page number in the table of contents next to Greek art. And as a reminder, I want five hand-drawn sketches per chapter. We're starting unit two, so you will do a detailed drawing for unit two due the day of the test. I don't know when that day will be. 
whenever we finish. An article will also be due the day of the test. All right, so let's dive into this. Where is Europe on this map? That's right. It's directly above Africa. It is uh, um, uh, the top center. So let's take a closer look at Europe and where is Greece in this map? This is the one with the Olianas. Yes, very good. So uh, down, let's take a closer look at Greece. <coughs> the I'm gonna go. Oh, there it is. All right. In the modern day, like Greece now covers all of this above. But in the ancient times, Greece was pretty much this area down here. It was this area is called Attica. This is the Peloponnese. This is Crete down here. And then we have the western edge of Turkey, which is the eastern edge of uh, Greece on these islands over here. And that is all um, part of Greece. All right. So there are different divisions in Greek art, all right? There's uh, the geometric, the orientalizing, archaic, early classical, high classical, late classical, and Hellenistic. <coughs> because of time constraints, we're going to skip the first two. And we are going to start with archaic. I need to make a correction down here. So excuse me. All right. This is 323 BC 31 AD. Are we good? We got it. Do you need more time? All right, we are going to jump into Greek art like I jump in the pool in the deep end <coughs> without dipping my toe in first. Um, so we're going to start with uh, uh, the Archaic period and their statuary. We're going to watch just a few minutes of this, if we can. So these are the tools, um, and then yeah, if you want to turn this on, but anyway. <laughs> We have lived the personality in this cup. The pillowcase. What is this? No card, guys? Can I just... Hey! This is gonna be fun! Okay, this is beautiful. I'm guessing that's marble. This is heavy. Can I seriously try? I am definitely not successful, but hey, that's okay. Because the best part about this episode today is that I have a fantastic sculptor and artist so everyone i'm gonna bring jean in and hopefully she's gonna tell me all the fun stuff i have right here i was surprised okay everyone this is jean jean say hi to you too hi uh, you too and i'm excited to be here so what's going on what's the episode about today what is this? so i was told that you have done a series on multiple 
We have, we've talked about marble and granite. We have a geologist in house that's come on before and talk. Well, so I'm an artist, I'm a sculptor, and marble is one of the things I love most. It's a little hard to describe. It's something that just happens when I touch it. There's a sensation that happens in my body that relaxes me. I can work for hours and lose time when I'm touching it, working with it, and having fun with it, and it's, and it's hard work. How did you learn to carve marble? Because I, you know, I tried a little bit, and you can't even see the scratch I did. I'm still in the process of learning. Eyes, eyes up on the screens, phones time. down. And this is Tennessee Marble. It's got these really beautiful crystals that shine and shimmer. Take the hammer, because a lot of times people ask me, when I show them my work, they'll say, how do you get started? Do you use power tools? You know, what do you do? And I always just say chisel and hammer, because it's the basics. And I think I've had this chisel since I was 21. How long have you been carving? I have an art degree. I started sculpting in stone when I was in college, and then I didn't do it for 30 years, and I just started again five years ago. You generally start an angle, and it just makes it look like. Sorry for face flying. And you just kind of decide to own it. I do have a lighter hammer here, too, if you want to try. Well, I, uh, that worked out. Oh, shoot. Look at I only made a line. You actually got some of it off. Well, I'll try again. <laughs> this is really relaxing. Right? So tell me about the differences on, like, what is each. Okay. This is the chisel I tend to use the most because it's got the prongs. And you don't worry That's called about a tooth the chisel. Lines. So you can see that it makes these lines, which help you. For me, it's almost like drawing your shape. So as I go around the piece, it helps me create knowing where I'm going. This chisel is a way to move stone. So that one's called the point. It's like a giant metal pencil. make lines with it where you go like like this and then you kind of take out a lot you score a lot it moves a lot of stuff and i will also say you know usually i'm in the head like you have your mouth covered and your eyes covered your ears covered hair covered you know like when i'm working it's because it covers a lot of dust yeah so yeah so your point is to move a stone and then this is more like refined things and it takes out all those Lines. Okay, so tell me a little bit about why you use Italian and Tennessee. All right, I'm going to stop it right there. I just wanted you to see people using those tools. So uh, here we go. Uh, our first Greek work of art is called the Kouros, K-O-U-R-O-S. And I want you to notice the stance or the uh, pose of the kuros. Notice that it is standing up and one leg is forward. Which leg is forward? The left leg is forward. What are the arms doing? Right, they're by the side. What are the hands doing? The hands are balled up like fists. Do you see that? All right, and I talked about this before, like with that one leg being forward, there should be a shift in the hips. Well, I talked about this with the Egyptian art, and there isn't. All right, so either that leg is longer than the other, very slightly, or the Greek artist at this point had not yet studied the nuance of the human body that when you have one leg go forward, the, the hips uh, shift a little bit. But you can see uh, <coughs> where the uh, Greeks got their influence from, and uh, it is the same pose as that of the Egyptians and these, uh, this Egyptian statuary. Um, and the Egyptians are just right across the Mediterranean. So the Egyptians and the Greeks are intermingling with trade. They're visiting each other's places, so they're seeing what is going on in the other uh, places. And so they're able to adapt and adopt some of the um, uh, uh, visuals from one culture into another. This gives you a sense of the size of a kouros. It's a rather large sculpture. All right, and uh, the Kuros is uh, it's a male sculpture, and the counterpart for the Kuros is the Kore. <coughs> And 
And so there is a 50 year difference between these statues. So they're all made kind of at the same time. Uh, these had a funerary purpose that they are grave markers. Uh, they are at the entrances of people's graves or inside of their tombs. And they are sort of a votive offering in sanctuaries. And the word kuros means youth. And these are the first monumental sculptures of the Greek culture. The two um, uh eras that we skipped, those were very small sculptures and mostly pottery. Now, what do you notice is the main difference between the Kuros and the Kore? What is it? Kore has clothes. That's exactly right. All right. So <coughs> the males are nude, whereas the females are clothed. In the Greek uh, uh, culture at that time, the nude male athletic body was seen as beautiful and the female body was not. It was uh, different than our culture today. So if you take like a typical prom photo or if you have a day at the beach, all right? So we did, when you look at the day at the beach or a prom photo, who is showing off more skin, the males or the females? The females are showing off more skin. That's our culture, that the, uh, the female form is more beautiful and the male form is more industrial or functional. And, but with the Greeks, it was quite the opposite. All right, this particular kouros here is called the New York kouros. And I have this uh, image right here that shows just how cartoonish and idealized uh, that this sculpture is. Notice the hair is very stylized. It has, like, and we'll, we'll look closer at the hair in just a second. The chest is very stylized. The abdomen is very stylized. Even the knees have these weird, like uh, these, these um, water, it's like a, a, a water line or something. Uh, and the elbows are very stylized. You have this V shape in the elbow. So it's almost like a cartoon of a person rather than a realistic person. Here's the backside and we get a three quarter view. And we look up close at the hair. Here we can see the idealized or the cartoonish hair. It does not look like hair at all. The cartoonish Corso. And with other Kuros, um, uh, you had this like weird hair as well, this cartoonish hair. But I want to point out his face. What expression does he have on his face? He's smiling, right. And, and you're right. I think he's smiling. It's a smirk, right? It's this very slight smile. It's not like a, a like he's not smiling for the camera, like a big wide smile. It's a smirk, right? And that is called the archaic smile. And all of these very old uh, Greek sculptures have the same expression on their face. And if we look at the backs of these Kuros sculptures, the muscles in the back are very cartoonish and unrealistic, which is typical of <coughs> the Kuros. And again, look at the hair. That is not hair. That's like a, a flat blanket, like an Afghan blanket or a, a, a knitted blanket. Now, this one right here, Kroisos, has an inscription that says, stay and mourn at the tomb of dead Croesus, whom raging Ares destroyed one day as he fought the, in the foremost ranks. So that's one of the reasons why art historians know that um, these are funerary, picture, uh, funerary sculptures, because the inscriptions on them refer to the person that they are for and 
uh, how they have passed on. This one is a lot more realistic than the earlier Kuros sculptures. It's not as cartoonish in the, uh, in the figure. In fact, we can look at this one, we can compare the two, and just a 70-year difference, you can see the improvement of the realism of the sculpture. I also want to point out the ankles. Do the ankles look weird to you? Or the transition from the ankle to the foot? Don't they look a little bit big to you? Like cankles, all right? That, the reason for that is uh, to support the sculpture. I told you that stone is a very hard substance, but when you have it in a very narrow uh, um, uh, configuration, like an arm, a neck, or a leg, then it becomes very weak. We have so much weight up here that it is be very easy for the ankles to break. And uh, I'm quite sure that some of these have broken and they've been put back together. But um, they, they made these ankles thicker than realistic because to, they wanted to support the weight. And that's another reason for the hair. The hair is long and that hair, like the neck and the hair make a thicker part of the sculpture so it won't break off. Also, these were polychrome. Uh, so I want you to know that term, polychrome. <coughs> this is a Roman sculpture, but it is a good example of polychrome. Polychromes means that they would paint on it. And it's quite... Uh, it's quite disturbing how garish the colors are, or in my opinion, the polychrome just makes it look ugly. These flat colors, it, it's colored in like a coloring book, and there's no nuance, there's no shading, there's no um, uh, 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 highlights and shadows. So it looks odd, like a coloring book. So we're used to these ancient sculptures looking like this, but when in actuality, they looked more like this. So on the left, we have a copy of the sculpture in its polychrome. Over on the right, they have re, uh, they have put the polychrome back onto the sculpture, or those are copies. I have seen in museums that instead of a plaster copy next to the sculpture, they would have a picture or a, um, a, a computer screen that has a digital image of what the sculpture would look like in polychrome. And I think I prefer that better. And then there's uh, a lot of talk uh, uh, nowadays about how um, the, the distaste in the polychrome is somehow tied to uh, uh, racism. But we're going to move on. All right, I want you to look at this Berlin Corre. <coughs> this was taken from the cemetery at Caradia. And uh, they don't know if she's a priestess or an attendant or possibly even a, a goddess. But the reason why I like to put this slide or this image into uh, the um, and to look at it is to look at the drapery of the body here. The drapery masks the body. The patterns mimic contours. Like it's a love of, of pattern instead of being realistic. So I'm talking about these vertical lines here on the dress. And the vertical line or these curved lines up on the shoulders here. And how 
if this was, it is typical of a dress to have these folds and curves that go vertical on a dress, but this is not natural. It's very cartoonish. It's very uh, 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 like stiff and, and um, it doesn't follow the contours of the human body. It's almost like it, to me, it looks like the stone that she has carved from. It doesn't look soft. It doesn't look uh, natural. Uh, by the way, in her right hand, she would have held a pomegranate, and that is the symbol of Persephone. Here's the back of, and then the feet look like blocks of stone as well. Uh, also, she would have been polychrome. You can see the different colors in the stone. It's all one stone, so the, um, the stain of the colors is still visible. But she looks like a block of stone. I want you to know what a peplos is. Peplos is a type of Greek dress. And when I say a columnar appearance, that means she looks like a column. These vertical lines in the folds of the dress look like the fluting of a column. Are we good to go? All right, moving on. So when you see this sculpture called a peplos core, now you know what that peplos refers to. It refers to the uh, dress that she is wearing there. Her extended left arm is uh, different from before. So they think that she was, it was holding a votive offering for Athena's sanctuary or possibly holding an apple. Do you remember the, um, the story I told you of the Trojan War? What fruit started the Trojan War? Do you remember the golden apple that Eros throw, threw into the wedding party and the uh, goddesses were fighting over it? And then they had to uh, ask Paris to judge between them. And then that caused him to fall in love with Helen. And then that set off the, uh, the Trojan War. It was all started. If, if she hadn't thrown an apple into there, the Trojan War wouldn't have happened. All right. So, But also in uh, Greek culture or in ancient Greek culture, if you threw an apple at a girl, that means that you were proposing marriage. And if she caught it, that meant that she accepted it, accepted the marriage or accept your proposal. And we can see a little bit of the, um, the polychrome in the hair and in the eyes and the lips. And then here are some, uh, what they think the polychrome would have looked like. And then here, what's new on this one is the asymmetrical uh, composition. No longer is the dress the same on both sides, but it is a, so it, it, it comes over uh, one shoulder instead of both. And then notice the hair now begins to go around the forms of the, uh, the body. And you can see that again over here. All right. So they're being a little bit more natural with, the way the hair goes around the body. However, the hair still looks unrealistic. But you know what it looks like to me? 
It looks like ramen. It looks like these people have ramen for hair. But I want you to look at like how far the Corey has come from the one on the left, the Berlin Corey, who looks like a block of stone. Now the one on the right looks so much more realistic, not very realistic, but a lot more realistic than the Berlin Corey. And <laughs> you can see that <coughs> the, the clothes and the hair is now uh, uh, going around the forms. And they often, these Kore would hold objects. So you can see that there is this, uh, this hole here and a hole here. That's where the arm would have been in. It would have had like possibly a second stone that slides into that hole. And it was a sculpture of a hand or an arm with a hand holding a ceremonial object. Maybe a, a little um, jar of oil that was lit maybe some wine for the god or goddess, or maybe uh, like a pomegranate or an apple. All right, so let's take a look at the vase painting. How are we doing on time? All right. This is a good video on how to paint and uh, make a vase. To make a vase, workers first mine naturally occurring clay and mix it with water and outdoor pools. Impurities in the clay would sink to the bottom. As the water evaporated, it left behind a layer of purified clay which was then heated by working to make it more malleable. To start to form a vase, a mass of clay is centered on a potter's wheel. In ancient times, the wheel would have been rotated manually by the potter or his assistant. This modern electric powered wheel works the same way. With his hands, the potter forms a depression in the middle of the clay. By pulling outward and upward slowly, he carefully forms the clay into the desired shape, depending on which type of vessel he is making. We don't know exactly what tools ancient craftsmen employed, but in addition to their hands, they may have used wood and metal implements, as well as sponges to shape and smooth the clay. The next day, when the vessel has dried slightly, excess clay is turned away and the surface is smoothed. A separately made foot is applied for stability. Handles made from coiled clay complete the shape of the vessel. Once the vessel has been shaped, it's prepared for painting. A fine liquid clay called slip is painted onto areas that the artisan wishes to be black. To provide a background for further decoration, an unpainted field is left here on the front side. This unpainted area will be decorated with a scene painted with black figure technique. After the clay had dried to a leathery hard texture, <coughs> the base painter could make a preliminary sketch in charcoal, which would disappear later during firing. Using the charcoal sketch as a guide, slip would be used to add silhouetted forms, often of human figures. Details and interior lines were then incised through the slip to reveal the lighter colored clay below. Additional details were often added using red ochre. When fired, it would turn purple to depict clothing, blood, and other details. To produce white, a pure clay with minimal iron oxide was used, often chosen to depict women's skin marble objects, animals, and patterns. With the painting complete, the vessel was ready to be fired in a kiln. This three-step firing process lasted approximately six to eight hours, but since there were no precise thermometers or accurate clocks, it required great precision and experience on the part of the craftsman. First, the temperature of the kiln was raised to about 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit. By allowing air into the upper chamber of the kiln, an oxygen-rich atmosphere was created. This produced red ferric oxide in both the clay and slip, which caused both to turn red. Second, the temperature was raised further to about 1700 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Air vents were closed and damp wood or wet leaves were placed in the stoking tunnel of the kiln. This created an oxygen poor and carbon rich environment. This produced black ferrous oxide in the and slip, which turned both from red to black. At this point, the slip became a glossy shell that was resistant to any further changes. In the third and final step, air was permitted to enter the upper chamber of the kiln again, creating an oxygen rich environment once more. The surface of the vessel not covered in slip turned from black back to red, and the glossy slip covered areas, such as figures, remained black. The kiln required around 12 hours to fully cool down, after which the bases could be removed. All right, so that is how they do uh, make these uh, black figure and red figure uh, uh, clay pieces. <clears throat> so there's different styles of the Greek vases. So this particular shape right here is called an amphora. But I want you to know the different parts of the, of the uh, vase. We have the lip at the top, the neck. The shoulder is where it gets wider. <coughs> the body is where the, the largest part of the uh, vase is. And then we have the foot at the bottom. Now I remember why I had this on here. They should have drawn this. Yeah, it's in my notes. Draw this in your notes. All right. Are we good to go? Do you need more time? All right. So this is called black figure vase painting, where the figures are the people and they are painted in black. And when I say painted, I use that term loosely. It's not paint. It's different forms of clay. So when it fires, some types of clay turn red, some types of clay turn black. And I do want you to know in art history that the term figure means a person, the human figure. All right, so when we talk about figure drawing, we're drawing the human figure. When we talk about figurative art, it's art about the human figure. In fact, these two paintings, or this painting and the sculpture, it's not about any particular person. It's not about uh, any um, uh, particular narrative. Uh, it is a study of the human figure. So when you see black figure vase painting, then we're looking at the figures or the people are painted in black and the background is painted in red. Black figure uh, vase painting isn't just about the human figure, though. There are other things in there, too, like the horsies. With black figure vase painting, it is the subject that is black. So the subject in this one is people on horses fighting each other. <laughs> the question is, do I, do the horses know that they're fighting or are they just happy to be ridden? Um, I, I think that horses uh, feel fear uh, because I know that when they get into certain situations, they, um, they, they, uh, act in a fearful manner. I don't know if in battle that they're trained to overcome that. All right. But I think they're trained to, to charge into battle and whether they feel fear at that time, I don't know. All right. Do we have time for a story?
Oh, this is a big story. All right. I'll try to do the story in the next seven minutes. All right. So <clears throat> Thetis and Peleus have a child named Achilles. Peleus is mortal. He's a king. And Thetis is immortal. She is a deity. And she wants Achilles to be safe. So what she does is she dips Achilles into the river Styx. And this makes him invulnerable to weapons. All right. Now, later on, he becomes best friends with Patroclus. They grow up together and they are trained together. Later on, Achilles is trained by Chiron. Uh, if you watch the movie um, Her Hercules by Disney, that um, uh, the, um, the satyr uh, trains, uh, trains Her Hercules. Uh, same way that Chiron trains Achilles. So he trains him to be a total badass in war. All right, so this is a time where they just realized that uh, Paris has just kidnapped Helen. And so they're going to gather up all the armies and go to war. And But there's a prophecy that says you're never going to win unless you have Achilles with you. But the, pro the prophecy also says that if Achilles fights in the Trojan War, he's going to die. So they can't go to war without Achilles, but if he goes to war, he's going to die in the war. So uh, they, <laughs> they talk Achilles into hiding. So he goes and he does, Thetis doesn't want her son to die. So she sends Achilles to the court of Lycomedes on Skyros. And she dresses him as a girl and kept him hidden among the king's daughters. All right. So you can imagine dressing a hero up like that. And so, all right. Um, Athena lets Achilles borrow the, but they, he gets found out. So he has to go to war. And also he doesn't want to dress up like a girl anymore. He wants to go to war. So Athena gives him the Aegis. And the and so when Athena goes or when Achilles goes to war, he carries the Aegis with him. You know what? I'm going to finish this. We're going to start. This story is just too big for today. So we're going to stop here, finish this story tomorrow. I don't want to rush this story. Turn in your sketchbooks. Upload your book summary assignments. I want your detailed drawings. Upload your unit one articles. And start working on your article summary assignment for Monday. It'll be due Monday. Don't wait until the end.